I'm down here in this very strange forest that rewilding Sweden has created. And here you see all the, a lot of trees are injured. And that is probably Anders. Anders is a very vicious guy. He goes around and injures the trees. I'm gonna try to defend his behavior. The man who tortures trees. About 10,000 years ago, the glaciers that covered this land melted, and the trees started to conquer the land. Birch, willow, pine, aspen, rowan, alder, and birch cherry. And then the spruce arrived, and the boreal forest took shape the taiga, an endless land of spruce and pine. There it is. It is the three-toed woodpecker. It's like the spruce woodpecker. The spruce and pine are well adapted to this climate, but we humans have pushed that balance even further. The natural progression of the forest is still visible. This is an old sawmill. Like 30, 30 years ago there was a sawmill here. And now nature has reclaimed this place. And it's... Uh, it's kind of obvious here that like the birch and the all. I'm gonna go with Swedish names. Gråal, they're like pioneers. They are already like 10 meters high. But then underneath, the spruce is coming. As soon as the ground is exposed by forest fire, or nowadays a clear cut, the pioneer trees are there. But the forest industry isn't built around the deciduous trees, so they are often removed. Just like I removed the weeds around my strawberries. Of course, when you grow strawberries, you want the strawberries to get all the nutrition and sunlight. And here, we mainly grow pine and spruce. And as a country, we are extremely good at this. By thinning the forest multiple times, we make sure the healthy trees with straight good logs get the growth. But sometimes you stumble upon patches of mistreated forest where the landowner isn't very interested in forestry. I love to explore these places. Here the forest is thinning itself. The trees that can't compete for sunlight and nutrition are weakened and die. Dead trees are everywhere. Some still standing and some on the ground. And they are all full of life. Allness in Kona. It's like, <laughs> so cool. This is so nice because it's like the, all the trees are, and then even the rowan trees, Sorbus Akiporia. Like, look at this rowan tree. Look at this rowan. What? What is this place? This is such a, such a, uh, what do you call it? Bonitiet. Wow, look at that. In a forest like this one with high site productivity and soil water movement, a few decades is enough to create lots of dead trees and a very wild feeling. But in many other places, it can take a very long time to accumulate the variation of trees needed to support the life that could be. But there is a way to speed up the process. That brings us back to Anders. It's not the pleasure of harming trees that drives his hammer. 
Men de, allt är ju lika gammalt. Så det är därför vi in och petar och försöker hitta på, hitta på grejer för att det ska gå och få den äldre snabbare. Här har vi ju tagit bort nu för att vi ska få med löv, lövträd som kommer upp emellan. Vi ska göra om det här till lövskog men det är ju, ganska, det är ju lång leveranstid innan, innan, det, innan det är fint. Det kanske tar 30 år här innan det här är bra för vitrygg i Hacksbett. Anders and Rewilding Sweden are involved in a project where they create a deciduous forest on the bank of the Ume River. It's like reversed forestry. They keep all the deciduous trees and remove the spruce. Där var det närmast ett konstverk. <laughs> Precis. Då gör man ett typ ett V så här som går ihop så att när det regnar så vinner det ner så här. Och så är det ett hål som är fördjupat bakåt, snett in och så här. Så då kommer det att bli, lägger sig vatten här så ska det så småningom liksom bli röta där inne. Sen, sen i vinter så ska vi göra en liten brasa på den här sidan där det, där det är katat. En liten, så det blir som en liten punktbränning av trädet. The place is like a test ground and an exhibition for veterinizing techniques. And eventually, this forest will become a forestry nightmare, full of diversity and rotten trees. And the poster species for this project is a bird that crave these kinds of forests. I think I made a film last year where I said that only the pros have seen it. And uh, you know what? I'm one of the pros now, because last fall I followed my friend, dog, and we found it. The white-backed woodpecker was not very rare in the beginning of the last century. It feeds on larvas and insects found in dead or dying deciduous trees. But as the modern forestry developed, population declined. And now it is a very rare bird. It should not be confused with a great spotted woodpecker. That one is very common and it can be found in many types of forests. I'm a really bad woodpecker. It's like I don't really find any food in here. But I can tell there is a lot of insects that have made all of these holes and fresh and old ones and... It's not hard to find a tree or two that seems suitable for the white-backed woodpecker. But a single tree is not enough. The white-backed woodpecker needs an entire forest full of such trees. Är det bara för en vitrygg i hackspätten vi gör det här? Nej, det är det ju inte alls tycker jag. Ibland så blir det så mycket fokus på vitrygg i hackspätten för att det är Sveriges ovanligaste fågel. Men det är, ju, det är ju egentligen att det är den miljön som vitrygg i hackspätten trivs i som har försvunnit. Det är därför den nästan har försvunnit fågeln också. Men den miljön gynnar ju en massa andra arter. Så jag, jag skulle vilja säga att det är miljön som är viktigast och sen alla de arter som, som hänger ihop med den miljön. The white-backed woodpecker is sometimes referred to as an umbrella species. That means if you create habitats for it, you are simultaneously creating habitats for many other species. But in some spots, there is still a long way to go. Här ser inte så vackert ut. Nej, här är det svårt att se visionen av... Av lövskogen, ja. Ja, men den kommer och fort går det faktiskt. Och... Här var det blött ut och det är mest grå det här. Här är en vitmossa som är lätt att känna igen. Som heter spärrvitmossa. Den har som små spärrblad ut på de här långa. Down in the wet parts of the forest. It's already looking quite good. Because when there is a lot of water the spruce have a hard time conquering the land. And the kind of deciduous forest they are creating once existed on the floodplains of the rivers. 
I was a little disappointed in rewilding Sweden when I first saw this place. Now it makes sense to me, but it's just not really following the the rewilding principles. The true rewilding thing to do here is of course to undam the river and let the flood create places like this. But the hydropower plant upstream is the second largest in Sweden. It will stay there for now. I think I heard the black woodpecker. If we would take our hands off the taiga and let the rivers and the forest fires direct this landscape, there would be a lot more deciduous trees in the forest and a lot more death and decay. Do you have any interesting thoughts to share? No, not yet. I don't know all the mechanisms that make up a society. And I don't know where the balance lies between utilizing nature and letting it run free. But I do think the balance is off when there's a need for a man who walks around torturing trees. Hey! Gillar du vad vi gör? Vill du vara med och göra Sverige till en vildare plats? Vi kan bara göra det här med hjälp av ditt stöd. Du kan gå in på vår hemsida rewildingsweden.com och där kan du hitta knappen donera och välja att bli månadsgivare eller bara ge en engångssumma. Du kan också följa vårt arbete här på vår Youtube-kanal.